But first, I want to talk a little bit more about that, what the judge held in that state case, because, um, you know, he ruled from the bench. Right. So we uh, we don't have as much to go on in terms of, uh, you know, a written opinion. We have a little bit, uh, you know, where he talks about how, uh, you know, you, the plaintiffs, showed enough evidence to prove that you were irreparably harmed and that this is a violation of your uh, constitutional rights under the Oregon state constitution, which, as you mentioned earlier, has basically a almost identical um, right to keep and bear arms protection as the federal constitution does. Uh, it's, it's slightly different, but it's effectively uh, you the same language. Um, uh, and, and so he, that was his reason for, for, you know, enjoining the, or temporarily restraining the entire law because even uh, a limited time uh, deprivation of somebody's rights is is not acceptable as, as, you know, paraphrasing what he said here. But can you give us a little more insight maybe to what he was saying in, in court uh, for how he reached those conclusions? Well, um, this case is, is not just about the uh, Measure 114. It has to take into account what happened as far back as uh, Heller versus Washington, D.C., and then McDonald versus Chicago, uh, as well as New York State Rifle and Pistol Association uh, versus Bruin, because that kind of set the stage uh, that that uh, the, the right to keep and bear arms um, is uh, an individual right, um, th- that it is incorporated into the states, meaning that states and local governments cannot infringe on that right. And then the Bruin decision gave us the process for which courts are allowed to evaluate cases uh, that uh, around the Second Amendment. Uh, in the past, uh, state and local uh, courts and even federal courts would use a two-step process to evaluate whether the issue at hand violates the Second Amendment. And then if it does, whether there's a government interest that will override the infringement that is being uh, foisted on the citizens of, of of the of the country or the state or the locality, um, in in which case that is the rationale that they have used to justify and allow all manner of gun control to exist throughout the country, uh, uh, from sea to signing sea. So the court said, no, the two step process is one step too many. If it infringes on the Second Amendment, it is unconstitutional. And if you, and, and, and they didn't give them a blank check, but they also said, uh, they, they said that, that it doesn't give you the ability to do anything you want. It, if you pass a law, there has to be an analog to the law that you are passing now to 1791, when the second amendment was ratified, not from 1791 to 2022. At the time of the signing, there has to be a historical analog. And if there isn't, by definition, the law is unconstitutional. And everything in Measure 117 uh, falls under the category of there being no analog. There were no background checks required. There were no uh, fees required. There were um, you know, no, all of the, the provisions, uh, bans on magazines, um, none of these things existed back then. So therefore, by definition, at the foundation, they are uh, unconstitutional. And I think that the judges are, 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 are looking at that. I, I hope that they are and realizing that, well, you know what? Uh, yeah, there's, there's the, the preponderance of, of logic is that, uh, Measure 114 is is unconstitutional, and and as has been stated throughout our legal system, uh, that uh, um, justice delayed is justice denied, and and they are taking a um, uh, the, the proper steps to ensure that the rights of uh, Oregonians are protected uh, until this issue is is resolved in the courts from start to finish, and that's a beautiful thing. Right. I think you gave a, a pretty good summation of uh, at least how a lot of, uh, you know, gun gun rights uh, advocates view the Bruin ruling. Um, and it seems like that's what uh, uh, Judge uh, Rashino, Rashio, 
I don't. I hope yeah. I don't pronounce, mispronounce his name. Don't Robert ask me Rashido. to butcher it. <laughs> I like the judge. <laughs> uh, this is this is the judge using Harney County, right. uh, Oregon, and um, you know it's it seems reading some of the quotes from the what was issued the written part of the ruling that it's in line with what you're describing here, especially in regards to the magazine ban. He, for instance, he writes um, absent entry of this temporary restraining order. Plaintiff, uh, plaintiffs will. Be deprived of their right to bear arms pursuant to Oregon Constitution Article 1, Section 27 by being made unable to lawfully purchase a firearm or bear a magazine of holding uh, holding more than 10 rounds of ammunition in the state of Oregon. Deprivation of fundamental constitutional rights for any period constitutes irreparable harm. And then later he says uh, the plaintiffs are persuasive that magazines are protected by the Oregon Constitution and firearms containing fixed magazines that can hold 10 bullets or more are in common use within Oregon, which obviously alludes to uh, the Heller decision, which found that uh, handguns could not be banned by Washington, D.C. because they were in common use for lawful purposes. Mm-hmm. And um, so, uh, you know, it's, he's fairly clear in the written order on those points. But um, I was just wondering if there's any further insight on um uh, you know, that he might have said from the, the bench during the ruling in regards to like the permits to purchase laws as you were t- articulating there. The argument against it is that there was no historical analog for that sort of uh, regulation uh, at the time of the, you know, at the time of the founding or really for long periods after that. But uh, does that something he actually directly said in court? Um, I didn't I didn't see that he said that. Um... I think that this judge took a measured and cautious and and proper um, position on on the the challenge to measure one fourteen um, there there was very little uh, i didn't sense any sort of a political bent or anything like that uh, it it was a, a judge doing a good judicial work uh taking in, into account the arguments that were made by um, our case and and the references that were made to what the law is across the land, the law of the land, and uh, the judge um, saw merit in our arguments and chose to issue this temporary restraining order. Now that, that doesn't you, guarantee. And you guys, that they, what's that? You did you you explicitly argued that about Measure One Fourteen that the for instance the permit to purchase law. Uh, yes, it doesn't have a historical analog and is therefore unconstitutional under Bruin. But that was your basic argument here. That that was part of the entire argument. Yes, uh, mm-hmm. pointing out all of the the, the problems, uh, the the lack of historical analog, um, and and the fact that uh, uh, you know the, the the fact of the matter is, Stephen, that e- even the voters cannot vote away a enumerated constitutional right. There is a process for changing the constitution and it is not by a referendum vote in in a state or the passage of a law by the legislature or even Congress. You cannot vote away those rights. And I think that sits, um, is, is sitting more uh, at the forefront of the minds of of judges who are considering some of these issues. And, you know, in other cases throughout the country, we know that judges have in anguish had to comply with the uh, Heller, McDonald, New York, uh, Bruin uh, decisions and the direction that the Supreme Court has given them. Um, but uh, th- this was not a tortured decision. It was measured. It was uh, uh, logical. And and I think that the judge did a really good job of, of uh, considering what the law of the land is and what it is that they did in the, in the state of Oregon with measure 114.